So I'm here today with Graham Neary, full-time investor and independent research analyst, who's going to talk to us about how you might start investing and how his investing style has evolved over time. Graham, thanks very much for joining us. Pleasure. Tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. So um, I've always worked in the financial industry. I managed to get an internship at um, sort of a small investment bank for a couple of summers. Then I moved to England because I'm originally from Dublin. And I was in England for seven years. I actually started out doing some uh, technical analysis work, which might surprise mm -hmm. a few people, but uh, that was quite fun. Uh, then I moved into the asset management arena as an assistant fund manager for an insurance company. And after a few years, I got promoted to fund manager there so that I had my own pot of money to manage. And that was a really wonderful way to learn, uh, you know, continue my sort of study of finance, uh, you know, doing, uh, you know, re real money transactions for a very large customer base at, um, at a very large international company. So that was, um, that was sort of my professional sort of employment career. Um, that all finished up around 2016. So at that point, I took a year out and uh, went to China. So I studied Chinese for a year in China. And then I reverted back to this side of the world, started writing the small cap report at Stockopedia with Paul. And uh, I've been doing that for a few years. And uh, more recently, I've set up a website called Cube Investments, which has been going for a few months now. So that pretty much brings us up to date. Tremendous. So if someone's looking at their future financial security, they're probably going to start by going to an IFA. What are your views on that? Sure. So I think that choosing an IFA is a very important and responsible thing to do for most people who aren't in the financial industry. So I fully support the IFA industry, you know, as it, you know, it may, it may need certain improvements in certain ways, but in principle, an IFA is an extremely important service. Um, so the main purpose of the IFA is to actually prevent you from making a terrible mistake with your own money. Generally, there are going to be layers of fees involved for people who go that route, but it is necessary um, in a lot of ways to avoid a catastrophic error. It's a bit like having a pilot flying your plane for you rather than flying it yourself. So while it's expensive, it's definitely a good choice for most people and they should find someone they trust. Clearly, I don't use an IFA myself because I do my own thing and a lot of our audience are, probably do their own thing as well. Um, but I suppose we're going to talk about the journey from needing somebody to pilot your plane to actually flying it yourself. Now, IFAs these days quite often are encouraging people to go into passive funds, which equally you might be able to do yourself. What's your view on passive funds? So I, again, think that passive funds are a fantastic invention. Um, they generally offer you very low fees. So... You could get global exposure to, to the world equity markets for probably less than 30 basis points. So that's less than 0.3% management charge to get wonderful diversification. If you're happy to stick just to the UK, you can get the passive fund for less than 10 basis points. So less than 0.1% management charge. So if somebody feels that they don't need to pay somebody to, to manage their money and can choose these passive funds in a low-cost stockbroker, they can avoid huge layers of fees, meaning that they'll compound their money much faster over time. I suppose the main barrier to that choice is A, not needing the advice, being able to do it yourself, and then B, having the psychological wherewithal to actually stick it out and maybe 
uh, invest through a bear market because in any equity investment, even if it is a very passive fund, you could be sitting on a drawdown that could last for months or even years. So the only real way to make sure that you get a positive return is to be in it for an extremely long time. In general, funds are a great choice for people who are uh, either using an IFA or if they're um, managing their own money, it's a great way to avoid fees if you go down the, go down the passive route. Uh, so that's kind of step two is investing your own money in funds, I would say. Can you just define what you mean by a passive fund? Sure. So a passive fund is simply a fund that tries to track an index or track a particular defined basket of stocks. So it's not trying to outperform. And how would you go about selecting the ETFs you're going to invest in? Well, that is a complicated question. Um, so I won't thank you for that question. <laughs> um, that is the sort of thing that people hire an IFA to do or they hire a wealth manager to do. Uh, if you feel you can do it yourself, then unfortunately I can't give you an easy answer. You have to look through the possibilities. Um, there's a bit of work involved in figuring out which ones you want. Um, personally, I'm actually invested in a fixed income ETF. So I invest in an ETF that buys short duration, high yield American bonds. And that's because I like to have a fixed income part in my portfolio, except where I believe that equity markets are incredibly cheap. And so I can get very high income from these high yield ETFs. Um, but that just goes to show you that there are huge options out there for people in the ETF world. The, probably the simplest ETF product is just something that tracks the FTSE or tracks um, a global equity index. Um, though these are massive funds, very low management charges. So if, you, if somebody just wanted to make a one decision investment, they would simply feed their money gradually into these equity ETFs over time. So if someone wants to go to their next level mm. and wants to start moving into managing their own money, what advice do you have for them then? Sure. So if I can continue the um, aviation analogy, right? So you're flying a plane. The main thing you want to do is avoid a catastrophe. And so there are well understood ways to avoid a catastrophe, namely diversification, and sticking to sort of uh, respectable indexes. So if somebody is starting out, if they're selecting individual companies to invest in, they should be very careful about only investing amounts that they can really afford to lose. And another trick would be to just avoid aim at first, avoid the small caps and just stick to the really well-known companies because if you've never bought a share before the first thing you need to do is learn how to do it and that's uh, that takes a little bit of learning uh, so um, you could just start out with the blue chips investing small amounts do a lot of reading very important and see what mistakes others have made and do your very best to avoid making the mistakes which others have made and have led them to catastrophe so that's like so a shortcut what do you think is the um, minimum size of a pot to start doing your own investing? Good question. If somebody's buying an individual share, they're paying transaction costs, which in my opinion make it uneconomic unless they have at least a few thousand pounds for that position. So then in terms of the entire portfolio they need, um, if, you're, if they're looking to diversify, uh, say with 10 or 20 stocks, then that implies they need perhaps, uh, I don't know, just pulling a number out, uh, out of thin air, maybe 50,000. Yeah. And um, you say start reading and do lots of research. Where should they start? Well, they should read the uh, small cap value report. <laughs> <laughs> but that's all aim focused. Yeah, mainly. sorry. No, that was a joke. Um, 
if you're brand new, you need to be very careful, I suppose. You know, just just read the Financial Times, I suppose. Um, read some mainstream magazines, and what like uh, Investors Chronicle? Yeah, just just the just the big mainstream magazines, and just see what other people other people are talking about, and go on the websites, and you know, buy some books. You know, books are probably more important than the news in terms of understanding finance. Top tip books. Sure. So. I mean, if you're interested in value investing, you can read The Intelligent Investor by Ben Graham. Um, that's, that's kind of the main one, I would say, just in, if you want to understand value investing. If you want to understand uh, trading and more short-term stuff, it's not really my specialty. So I, won't, I wouldn't recommend a book on that front. So coming down to your own investing, what are your, what's your style of investing? How do you select a share that you're going to invest in? Sure. Well, that is changing over time as I learn things. I'm still somewhat youthful, so I'm, I hope that I'll continue to learn and improve over time. Um, but I'm trying to find companies that I'm happy to basically stay in for a very long time. I have a no-selling policy that I generally won't sell anything unless it's something I've really lost faith in, where I've realized that my investment thesis was just wrong and that um, I really don't want to own it anymore. But it, that's quite, um, it's quite a significant threshold. You know, if a company suffers a, a small profit warning or doesn't do quite what I expected it to do, I'll generally still hold on to it because one of the most difficult things in investing is beating your transaction costs. And so unless there's something else I really want to own instead, I like to just let things take their course. And generally I'm buying shares where the balance sheet is okay. So even if the profitability doesn't do what I expected, then it's probably going to have some time to recover. So, I mean, balance sheet strength has always been something I've had an interest in when I'm buying a share. So generally I'm, I'm, I'm avoiding companies that are going to go bankrupt. So what's the largest loss you'll sustain in your portfolio? You know, how it's always very discouraging when you look at your portfolio and, you know, the red appears because you're in a negative position with it. How negative will you let it go? I don't have a specific number on that front, Tamsin. Uh, so I will just take each company on its specific merits. You know, I am, you know, I invested a very small percentage of my portfolio in um, a company called uh, DP Eurasia. And I was sitting on a loss of over 50% in that at one point. So it became even smaller in my portfolio. Um, but I looked at it on its specific merits and I didn't see the harm in, in leaving it. So um, if I look at, I just look at the specific merits of it and say, well, do I have to sell it because it's going to go bust or because it's performing much worse than I thought it would? Or if it seems like there's prospects for it to recover, then I'll, I'll hold on. I mean, I always go back to the example of um, Berkshire Hathaway, um, which has seen 50% drawdowns on several occasions in its own share price. And it has been a fantastic performer for investors over the years. So if you if investors sat through those 50% drawdowns and sold, they missed out on massive rebounds. Mm -hmm. So I think being okay with a 50% drawdown sort of goes with the territory of being a buy and hold fundamental investor. But it doesn't leave for much margin of safety. If they come out with another profit warning, it's it's pretty miserable. Mm. So what's the catalyst that makes you sell out of a position? I have seen an evolution in my own style from value towards quality. And I've sold out of several positions over the last two years, which were based on that legacy approach. And it was very painful to sell those positions and take the loss. But 
the subsequent performance of those companies uh, sort of just helps to justify the decision that actually they were bad companies, and I you know I've seen them go on to do poorly since. So, you know, the catalyst there was the realization that my approach was wrong, my reason, and that their prospects were really quite poor. I suppose that's that's my answer in terms of just realizing that my thesis was wrong and they're not going to perform well. But you have to look at the specific company um, to come to that decision. So talk us through some of the value versus quality decisions using mm. specific companies, if you can. I mean, there was a company I owned called um, Oket Swank, which is a firm of architects. And I would never buy shares in a company like that today because I don't buy professional services companies anymore. I don't really buy people businesses anymore unless there's something very, you know, very standout special about them that I can't even imagine right now. Because? Um, because they, they, they're just at risk of losing their employees. Their employees can set up somewhere else. You know, I think a lot of these people businesses should be privately owned. And it sort of boggles my mind that law firms are listing now that would always have traditionally been privately owned and people are buying shares in these things. But how is, how is a law firm going to outperform its peers if it's paying dividends to external shareholders when its rivals don't have to do that. Its rivals can pay all the money to staff. So surely the rivals will get will get all the best staff. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I don't I don't buy that type of company anymore. Uh, so I have nothing specifically against Orket Swank. As it turns out, it's been very poor investment uh, for investors on the exchange so far. Uh, but I think that's more to do with the type of company it is rather than something that's particularly uh, rotten about that company in particular. So why did you buy into that originally and how is that different to what you now do? So originally I was looking for very cheap companies and it was very cheap. Um, it had, uh, you know, in terms of the earnings multiple and so on, it was probably low single digit at the time. And I naively thought that share price should re-rate. Um, another red flag there was that it was involved in some acquisitions. And that's something else, that's something that I avoid now in my own portfolio. I avoid companies which are, make very heavy acquisitions. Um, I, I much, much prefer to see organic growth. So that's where my approach has changed. And I think I'm probably not alone in that because the, if you look at the uh, valuations out there at the moment, organic growth is being valued very highly by the market, which I think is rational. You know, we shouldn't um, underestimate the extent to which the market is actually very rational and a lot of pricing actually makes sense most of the time. And I think a lot of investors are appropriately valuing organic growth in a very high way. But when I see a company making a lot of acquisitions, I tend to see it as a, a sort of a flag rather than as uh, something positive. But there are companies like Keyword Studios and IdeaGen that do a lot of acquisitions and they're still valued quite highly. Sure. And I mean, personally, I don't uh, participate in those stories. Um, you know, I'll be very interested to see how they work out for investors. But um you know, the stock market is littered with failed buy and builds and um, it tends to put a lot of strain on the balance sheet. Um, integrating companies is an extremely difficult task. You know, I, I mean, before I was um, in my current sort of uh, employment status, I was inside companies which merged with other companies and I saw firsthand the difficulty attendant with that process, different cultures coming together, redundancies, people um, sort of uh, jostling together different teams. And it's it's such a complicated thing, integrating companies, that um, I think we should be very cautious about it. 
Um, I believe that, you know, from an academic point of view, I think a lot of financial professors would say that acquisitions tend not to generate much value, if any value, and may in fact be destructive, um, you know, as a statistic. So I think, I just think we should be very cautious about that, about that whole st strategic approach. And um, have you got any other examples of what you used to do with value and what you're now doing with quality? Another example would be, say, uh, Tandem Group, which I don't own shares in anymore, bicycle company, and again, very low earnings multiple uh, when I bought shares in it, uh, but it turned out to be a very unsuccessful investment. You know, I think I was, there was a point some years ago when I was hypnotized by a low earnings multiple, and I didn't think hard enough about the sort of political reality of a company. And by that, I mean the power dynamics within a company. Um, I think maybe a politician could be quite a good investor because they can understand these dynamics. I sort of now understand that the insiders need to have some shareholder orientation and their track record says a lot. And at Tandem specifically, the level of remuneration in relation to dividends and profits is way out of whack. And that company has a track record going back an incredibly long time of not really generating much value for shareholders. Mm -hmm. And so even though there's a small dividend, um, nothing's really happened for shareholders yet. Maybe it will happen in the future, but I'm glad I don't own shares in it anymore because if history is any guide, then you would say probably not. And you know, at that point several years ago when they were extremely profitable, they made some acquisitions. And the amount of money they spent on the acquisitions ended up being comparable to the market cap of the company subsequently. So it's just another example where I didn't really understand the dynamics. I hadn't really thought hard enough about the shareholder orientation of the company and its growth prospects. And I wasn't careful enough about uh, the problems with acquisitions. So again, being hypnotized by a low P multiple is an extremely dangerous thing in my opinion. So you've moved away from that and far more into quality. So give us examples of where you've put your money instead. Well, I'm still very heavily uh, biased towards financial stocks. So I'm invested in things like um, Duke Royalty, H&T, IG Group, and uh, Park Group, and Valvery. So I have, a, I have a lot of affinity with financial stocks and some of them I did enter uh, partly for value reasons and partly because I like the company. Um, I suppose once you get away from the financial stocks, you're into more uh, examples of quality companies. So companies which I personally think are quite quality would be Burberry, which is a very important position for me. And then on a slightly smaller scale, um, Ritvik, which I recently bought some shares in. Um, so I'm looking quite closely at the drinks sector now. Um, I have, a, have family history with Diageo, so I'm, I always uh, sort of keep half an eye on Diageo shares. Um, obviously, Fever Tree has been a massive success for investors, and I sort of regret not picking up some shares recently when it when they fell quite low. Um, still a massive valuation. Yeah, still still quite highly valued, but I don't own shares in it, but I, it's one it's one that I'm sort of monitoring. Nichols, I don't own shares in that, but it's another one I'm looking at. And AG Bar, uh, another example. So I think the drink sector is very interesting uh, as an example for quality companies. Uh, there's another one that doesn't really get talked about much, um, Coca-Cola Hellenic. Uh, CCH, which is a, a Coke bottler in Greece, which is, you know, very big. London listed? Yeah, very big company, London listed. Uh, but that's another one where I'm keeping an eye. So 
I think the drink sector is really, really interesting uh, for quality. Um, and general uh, sort of consumer and I suppose they call it FMCG, fast moving consumer goods, really good sector for in terms of quality. Uh, I own shares in Distill, which is a small owner of drinks brands. That's a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, sort of uh, racy, that one. I'm not sure if it's going to work out or not, but, um, you know, I've put in a size that I'm okay with, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. But, um, yeah, I'm interested in that, in that whole sector now. Things where the customers are highly diversified and, um, you know, I suppose that's another example where I've moved away from value and towards quality. One of the big risks that I try to avoid now is customer concentration. Mm. And you can see how many profit warnings on AIM are driven by a contract delay or an order being pulled. And that risk factor, I think, doesn't really get priced in very much because people aren't looking at it um, closely enough. And it says it in the annual report, um, if there are customers that are especially big, the company is obliged to say so. And you can see massive concentration sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I generally avoid those cases now. Going back to financials, which is a big part of your portfolio, what are the characteristics of those financials that appeal to you? Sure. So every financial is a little bit different. Uh, you know, you have financials dealing with the general public. And then you also have investment vehicles. So Volvery, which is my biggest position, is an example of a vehicle rather than something that's selling directly to the public. Then you have companies like IG Group, which sell to the public. Uh, one that I forgot to mention so far is PCF, formerly uh, Private and Commercial Finance. You, I'm sure you've probably mm -hmm. met them. Um, so they're, they're a lender. Uh, and they have a retail product for savers as well. So they are they're using their balance sheet to generate uh, a good return on equity. And hopefully that return on equity is going to improve over time. So one of the attractions of financials is that the return on equity has some predictability to it because they're, they're using their balance sheet to, to do it in a predictable way. It's a, bit, it's a little bit like property investing mm -hmm. companies. Um, although property is uh, sort of lower risk, lower return in general than what a financial stock yeah. should be able yeah. to do. Like a good uh, niche lender should be able to generate better returns than a property investor because, the, you know, there's just a little bit more, a uh, little bit more specialism involved. So, yeah, I mean, I just think it's a, it's a really nice sector. Another one that is incredibly boring and nobody ever talks about it, is the insurance industry. But, you know, there's some incredibly good insurance companies listed as well. Probably my favorite one would be Hiscox. I don't own shares in it, but when I was managing other people's money, I was putting them into high quality financials like Hiscox, which did incredibly well for customers. And, you know, an insurance company is another example of a financial stock that can generate really, really good returns for investors, but it's probably a little bit boring and unfashionable, and so it doesn't really generate any controversy, but um, that, would, that would be an interest of mine. So what sort of average rate of annual return are you trying to achieve from your investments? Sure, well, I don't have, I don't have very high ambitions um, in terms of a number, I just want to try and beat the footsie. That's sort of my main goal because that was always the discipline, you know, uh, when I was, you know, managing por other people's portfolios, it was just about trying to beat, beat the index uh, over a three year cycle. So that's still what I try to do is just beat the index as much as I can. And, you know, if like, if the index has a very bad year, I don't expect to be immune from that. If the index has a very good year, I hope that I'm going to be able to participate, although maybe I won't. But I think small percentages make a huge difference in the long run. So even like, if somebody was able to beat uh, the FTSE by 3% a year, over a lifetime, that generates an incredible difference in uh, retirement funds. So... I mean, simple. I mean, 
simply 3% better than the index would generate a massive difference. Mm. And I, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd probably be satisfied with that, to be honest. And it's all about risk management. So how do you go about risk management? I think a lot of my interest in the quality style of investing stems from uh, risk management, in fact, because what I realized was that the value stocks were risky, that they had, they had risks that I hadn't thought about properly, mm -hmm. whether that's customer concentration or reliance on key customers, um, reliance on key products, which if they fail, will have a devastating effect on revenues. So now my entire process is about avoiding these risks. You know, on a company-specific level, I'm looking for obviously the basics like a good balance sheet, not diluting shareholders unnecessarily, and so on. And then qualitative things like having good market share, having a good diversified customer base, um, having a management team that's trustworthy. Um, you know, being registered in the UK is a big thing. So there are ways you reduce that that way. And then from a portfolio view, just not betting the farm on uh, on uh, on something that you're not sure about, um, or you know, preferably not betting the farm on anything. Keeping everything reasonably tight and allowing your portfolio to be concentrated if you have a big winner, because that sort of goes with the territory of investing that. If you invest in a good company, it's going to probably be worth several times what you invested in it. So that will lead to an element of concentration, but I think that's okay. So accepting that type of concentration, but not going getting too concentrated on day one. And what's the largest position size for any one position you'll allow? Uh, well, again, I don't have a rule on that because I'm happy for my successful investments to grow to any size. I did top slice uh, H&T because I'd done particularly well on that at one point. Um, at one point, it ended up being 25% in my portfolio. So I, I had to take some off the table there uh, psychologically. But I think if I was purely oriented towards getting the best possible returns, I probably wouldn't have top sliced it because it was still good value at that level, in my opinion. Uh, but psychologically, I wasn't able to deal with with anything more than that. Um, at the moment, Valvery is um, maybe 16%. So you don't set stops. Do you have a target price to sell at? No, no target price. Remember, I have a no selling policy. So I'm, I'm looking to hopefully sell nothing ever. <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I never get disappointed by a company, I will try to never sell it. And you don't trade at all? You don't try and get a share for the ride and then get out of it? Very rare. I mean, last year I did that once with Game Digital, where I just noticed one day that the discount to cash it had was enormous. So I figured uh, it was probably going to re-rate a bit because the discount to net cash was too big. Um, and it did, and I sold didn't really make much money out of it, but um, in general, I avoid that temptation. So last year, 2018, was a fairly volatile year and not particularly good in terms of returns. What's your prognosis for this year? I think that the prognosis this year is quite good. Um, I just checked the uh, number on the Stockopedia homepage today, and I think the median PE estimate is... 11.8, so just less than 12 times PE ratio for companies with estimates. So that says to me that there's decent value out there. Uh, unfortunately, the market is very efficient and a lot of the good companies do have high valuations, but given that the median is at 12 times, there has to be some good companies uh, at reasonable levels just I'd be very surprised if there weren't, and I'm looking for them. Do you have any idea what it was this time last year? Um, I don't, actually. But you, if you were going to guess, what would you imagine? Probably about the same, or maybe uh, maybe 13. Okay, so there's no justification why last year it was much more volatile than it's going to be this year. Well, I suppose um, 
I suppose this year we have to deal with the the the, the Brexit um, outcome or some some kind of move. Something's going to happen, um, but. I'd like to think that a lot of it has been priced in already. I could be completely wrong, but um, particularly on AIM, AIM was really uh, blown up really at the end of last year. So um, uh, that kind of says to me that there there must be some opportunities out there. Uh, I think investor confidence has been badly bruised by the uh, patisserie Valerie issue. I think that's that's going to cause people to lose faith in the system mm. which is inevitable um, and that's just a sort of a tragic uh, case I mean nobody died but uh, financially it is a, it's a tragedy uh, what happened there and for all the employees as well I don't you know who face a lot of uncertainty mm. um, so I would say that the mood out there is is fairly tempered if not a little bit depressed and that is generally a good time to buy. Graham, thank you very much indeed for all your thoughts and your time. A pleasure, thank you.